is The Thriving Dentist Show with Gary Takas, where we help you develop your ideal dental practice, one that provides personal, professional, and financial satisfaction. Welcome to another episode of The Thriving Dentist Show. I'm Gary Takas, your podcast co-host. Today's episode is titled, What is the Best Practice Model? Well, I'm excited to share some thoughts and insights uh, with you uh, on that topic today. Hey, before we get to that topic, I have two quick announcements to make. Coming up uh, in May uh, is our uh, Thriving Dentist MBA Livestream Workshop. It's coming up. uh, It's three consecutive evenings. It's nine hours of content, um, three hours an evening. Uh, It's May 16th, 17th, and 18th. That'll be a Tuesday night, a Wednesday night, and a Thursday night. In the Thriving Dentist MBA uh, live stream workshop, I cover the 10 elements of a thriving practice. Now, let me give you a little bit of history on this workshop. Um, We did our last Thriving Dentist uh, MBA workshop at the end of 2022, and we made a strategic decision to sunset that course to no longer offer that course. Uh, We're we're excited about some of the things we're doing in terms of master classes and other courses that we decided to sunset that one. However, we received so much positive feedback from from dentists all over the country uh, that wanted to attend one last Thriving Dentist MBA workshop. So we decided to bring it back just one more time. This is the last time it will ever be offered. It's May 16th, 17th, and 18th three hours an evening. I cover the 10 elements of a thriving practice. Uh, It literally is everything you need to know about the business side of your practice. Um, Think about it as uh, like a one day MBA. Um, And I'd love to to have you attend if you're interested. This will be the last time we do that. We're bringing it back one more time out of popular request. Very inexpensive. Um, It's nine hours of CE. You get a massive amount of CE spread out over three evenings. Very enjoyable. I run it more like a workshop than a lecture. And I uh, want to encourage you to come join us. You can go to thrivingdentist.com forward slash MBA um, if you'd like to attend that last Thriving Dentist MBA workshop. All right. My second announcement is we have a returning guest. Uh, it's my friend, Nate Williams. Uh, Nate Williams is a uh, financial expert and he brings great advice. He's been a wonderful contributor in the past and we're excited to have him back. And today... He has a topic that I think you're going to find of keen interest. Is paying the least amount of taxes a wise financial strategy? Well, you'll find out quickly what Nate has to say about that. And I think he's uh, spot on. With no further ado, here's Nate Williams. Hello, this is Nate Williams. I'm a dental CPA working for Practice Financial Group. Practice Financial Group is a full-service CPA and financial services firm dedicated to meeting the complex business and personal financial needs of dental practice owners. Here's my financial tip for you today. Paying the least amount of taxes possible is not a winning financial goal. In order to build wealth, you need income. The more income you earn, the more wealth you can build and the faster you can do it. In America, as with most countries, we pay an income tax. Contrary to what the media or deceptive politicians might suggest about rich people not paying their fair share, rich people do pay most of the taxes. Now, of course, I don't want you to pay any more than you legally have to, but to earn less than you can, or to spend money frivolously in your business to avoid taxes would be like a soccer team deliberately not scoring a goal because they don't want the other team to take possession of the ball. In soccer, if you can score a goal, you score the goal. With your practice, if you can earn money for doing honest work, you earn the money. Likewise, if you can responsibly save money in your practice, you save the money. And like the soccer team who has to give the give the ball to the other team, you pay the taxes as you earn more income. In summary, paying the least amount of taxes is a losing strategy. Rather, your strategy should be to manage and proactively plan for the taxes you pay. 
minimize your tax liability responsibly and in a way that simultaneously builds your wealth. And work at a pace that you can keep up forever. In conclusion, paying the least amount of tax is not a winning financial strategy. The wealthiest dentists will look back over the course of their lives and realize that they also paid the most in taxes. I hope this is helpful. Good luck. Welcome back to the Thriving Dentist Coaching in Action segment. I want to take a minute to thank Nate for that wonderful tip. And I agree with him, you know, if you want to pay less taxes, um, that may not be a good strategy if it means you end up making less money. So, well, actually, the best strategy to pay no to pay no taxes, Darren, is to not make any money. <laughs> right. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> be care. Be be care. You know, be wise about choosing the right financial game that you're playing. Right. And I think Nate makes some brilliant points. I always love his. Uh, I love his perspective. Absolutely. And uh, today's episode is going to be a fun one. Once again, this is Narain. I'm your co-host of the Thriving Dentist Show. Gary, I love this particular topic. What is the best practice model? That's a question. Even I have been asked, even though I'm not a coach, I'm not an expert in this. And I think this is a question that perhaps many, many, many dentists out there are constantly grappling with. What is the best practice model? And um, take it away. Well, Naren, like um, so many questions, um, the the best answer for that, what is the best practice model is, it depends. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> However, I'm going to get way more specific with you in this coaching in action segment. Uh, you know, we call the podcast The Thriving Dentist Show. And I'm often asked uh, by listeners, hey, what does it mean to have a thriving practice? And I like to say, um, well, a thriving practice is one that provides personal, professional, and financial satisfaction. Personal satisfaction is where you're taking care of patients you enjoy, surrounded by a team you love. Uh, professional satisfaction is you're doing more of the kind of dentistry that you like to do. Whatever that is, whatever it is that you like to do, you're doing more of it. And finally, financial satisfaction is more uh, uh, fundamentally explained by uh, simply saying that you're rewarded uh, handsomely uh, for your care, skill, and judgment. And that's what it means to have a thriving practice. So let's come back to that professional uh, uh, part of the definition of a thriving practice, personal, professional, and financial satisfaction. Let's come back to a professional satisfaction, doing more of the kind of dentistry that you like to do. One of the really cool things I love about dentistry is there's many flavors of, of dentistry. And what I mean by that, there's lots of different ways um, to practice based on your interests. And I think the quick way to happiness is doing what you enjoy doing, whatever that is. Um, do more of what you, if, if you enjoy it, you're likely to be very good at it. Does, doesn't that connection make sense, Naren? If you enjoy it, you're likely to be good at it? Absolutely. Yeah. If, if you're having fun, then it becomes play, right? And uh, it's like, we always get better at a game we love or yeah. anything that we really love doing. And even think about continuing education. If there's a topic that you really love, you get excited about going to your next CE course. Exactly. You know, in, in that area. You know, you start thinking about it way in advance. You start packing for it. You get excited about meeting your mentors out at CE courses so you can do more and more of whatever that is. Um, I would like to say that I think there is a misguided notion in terms of a practice model that I'd simply like to share my thoughts with you on that. I think one of the misguided models is that the only way to be successful in dentistry is you have to do everything. You have to become, I've even heard labels, some consultants will use labels and terms. Uh, you have to become a decathlete dentist. You know, I think they've chosen that word decathlete because it's alliteration, DD, you know, right. a decathlete dentist. Uh, right. Now, I, I happen to really enjoy, most of you will know that I'm a runner um, I like to run. Uh, I tend to be an endurance runner. I do marathons, half marathons and triathlons, but I also love track and field. Uh, and so the concept of decathlete is very interesting. If you're, if you're not a track and field aficionado, you may not know uh, what the de decathlon is. Uh, the decathlon is 10 events uh, that participants have to do over two days. It's typically an Olympic event and they do those 10 events over two days. 
So those are very well-rounded athletes, Aaron, because when you look at the 10 events they have to do, they have to be really good at diverse track and field events. And they're, they're, I think it's a misguided notion that in order to be successful, you've got to be a decathlete dentist. You've got to do everything. Right. And I would like to dispel that myth um, because I, I think that, I think it, it emanates uh, from a flawed uh, mindset. And the flawed mindset is scarcity. There's mm -hmm. not enough of whatever it is you like to do. So you have to do everything. There's not enough right. of it out there. So you have to do everything. And given the choice, choice of a scarcity mindset or an abundance mindset, I'm always going to go with abundance, an abundance mindset, right? as opposed to scarcity. Let me ask you this, Gary, uh, this, those who try to do everything, and you have worked with quite a few dentists. Um, do you see they having fun? Do you see them succeeding or not, not as much versus the people who don't try to do everything just for the sake of doing everything? What I typically see is, is that uh, it's a, it's a rare dentist. They do exist. I want to make that point. They do exist, mm -hmm. but it's a rare dentist that truly enjoys doing everything. I see. They do exist. And if you happen to be in that very distinct small group of dentists, then I applaud you and way to go. That truly can do everything. And you enjoy doing everything. Right. If that's the case, then don't let me put a wet blanket <laughs> on your goal of having a practice that literally does, uh, you know, does everything. But I find that most dentists don't have the interest or the personality type to, to really enjoy doing everything. Uh, and they become uh, uh, more, by choice, more narrowly focused. Um, but if you are that rare individual that truly enjoys the diversity of, of like literally throughout the day, doing a wide variety of procedures throughout the day, then do not let me put a wet blanket on that. Then a, uh, you know, a, a broad based practice is a great model for you. Uh, but I don't think you have to be a decathlete dentist uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to be successful today. Um, I happen to have an opinion um, and this is something that I often share with my clients when asked, uh, but I have an opinion about what I think is a, a really great practice model. I think a great practice model is where the bread and butter of your practice is everyday general dentistry, the bread and butter. Um, and in addition to the everyday bread and butter, you include some high value services that you really enjoy doing as well in your practice. Not necessarily all of them, but there may be some high value. You may enjoy doing cosmetic dentistry. You may enjoy um, doing more adult orthodontics. Uh, another thing you may enjoy is placing and restoring implants. Maybe those are your three high value services. So, and again, I'm making those up randomly uh, based on where I see dentists that have some interests. And, but I think the foundation of everyday general dentistry is a great foundation that makes your practice um, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, say it, dare, dare I say recession proof? Well, right. I'm going to say it, <laughs> make sure practice recession proof because everyday de general dentistry is, is going to be services that are needed all the time. Right. You know, there's, there's, uh, it's not, uh, dependent on a good economy to have a thriving practice. And when you say everyday general dental dental practice, you are, you're talking about one that's anchored or built around a strong hygiene practice, correct? It would be it would be a strong hygiene department. It would be doing things like, um, uh, you know, like like fillings, like crowns, um, you know, the things we see every day. Maybe limited um, oral surgery. Maybe you enjoy doing simple extractions. Maybe you do um, a certain endo in your practice. Maybe you enjoy. Uh, doing, say, anterior bicuspid first molar, as long as it looks like you could do that root canal in an hour or less, that might be a good way to decide, you know, to incorporate endodontics in your practice. You know, if you practice in an urban area or in a suburban area, uh, there's probably great specialists nearby that you can refer to for things that are outside of your scope. Right. 
And, you know, I don't think you have to keep everything in house. Um, I don't think that's, that's necessarily wise. Now, if you're practicing in a very remote area, you may have to broaden your scope. You may want to broaden your scope um, because of the fact that a patient might have to drive hours and hours and hours to go to an orthodontist. Maybe the nearest orthodontist is, is, is three hours away. And orthodontic treatment isn't one and done. You know, it's a whole series of appointments. You may choose to incorporate ortho because you want to serve your patient's orthodontic needs and they're not being served in your community. But I think what I just described is a pretty unusual situation, you know, today right. uh, where population centers are today. Um, if you're interested in rounding out your general dental experience, I would strongly encourage you to get involved with the AGD, the Academy of General Dentistry, and work on your fellowship, earn a fellowship, and perhaps even later earn a mastership. Um, and that requires you to take a massive amount of area in a massive amount of CE and seven different sub disciplines within dentistry that will make you a very well rounded general dentist. And again, you don't have to do everything, but you're going to be very well rounded. And then when it comes to the high value services, pick the things that you like to do uh, that you really, you know, you, you, if the idea of thinking about going to a CE course on cosmetic dentistry gets you excited about the, the coming trip for CE, then that's something that you ought to do more of. Um, by the way, I'm going to come back to the, the, the general dental practice foundation. One of the really cool things about the general dental practice foundation, besides it being recession proof, you know, that's a pretty cool thing, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. I think uh, as we are moving into a pretty uh, uncertain times in some sense, because of the economy, the inflation, you know, interest rate, all these forces. And of course, now we have wars going on on the sidelines, which we haven't had in a long time. So I agree. I think recession is uh, and how to be how to have a safe practice is probably in everybody's mind. Well, I mean, let's face it. We've, we've got some possible headwinds, economic headwinds. Right. I, I, I hope we can avoid those. But we've got some possible economic headwinds. And I believe a general dental foundation will serve you well if those headwinds uh, you know, come to fruition. But one of the other cool things about having a general dentist practice foundation is that you can cultivate your high value services among your general dental patients. So you can plant seeds, perhaps cosmetic dentistry. Uh, you know, maybe your 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 patient um is interested in improving their smile, but but they're not ready to do that yet. Uh, and you can cultivate those seeds. And very often those high value services can come from your existing patient base who realizes you also do those things. Um, and as a result of that, you, know, you can, uh, in, in essence, plant a lot of seeds and cultivate those and do a whole lot of high value services, you know, once you've earned the trust of, of, your, of your patients. So that's another great uh, byproduct of having a general dental foundation is it, it lays the groundwork to doing a lot of high value services on patients who already know, like, and trust you. But now on high value services, pick the things that you like to do. You know, I, I suggested three a minute ago, maybe, maybe it's adult orthodontics, uh, maybe it's cosmetic dentistry. Now, cosmetic dentistry could be a lot of things, but I tend to think of uh, cosmetic dentistry as lab fabricated porcelain veneer cases. Um, great way, uh, you know, to, to grow um, that, that part of your practice. Uh, perhaps it's placing and restoring dental implants. You know, the need for dental implants is huge, Naren. Uh, I'll share a statistic with you that may surprise you. Uh, Naren, uh, of, of Americans, do you know that 76% of Americans age 35 and older are missing at least one tooth? 76%. And by the way, that doesn't include um, our third molars, our wisdom teeth. So 76%, more than three out of four adults, 35 and over, are missing at least one tooth. And they could be a candidate for, for a dental implant. Now, maybe within dental implants, you're not uh, excited about placing them, but you'd like to restore them. Uh, and in that case, you could work with a specialist. It could be an oral surgeon. It could be a periodontist. Uh, you could work very closely with a specialist to place the implants, and then you could restore them. Um, maybe you're the, the kind of dentist that enjoys placing your implants, and you can take a massive amount of CE, become very competent at placing implants, and you can place and restore implants in, in, in your own practice. 
Um, other examples of high value services um, could be trading OSA, obstructing sleep apnea. Maybe that's something you really enjoy doing. Uh, maybe it's doing oral conscious sedation. Oral conscious, I think of that as a high value service, oral conscious sedation. Um, maybe it, you know, we can get very narrow in, in, in scope. Maybe you're that dentist that loves to do the ankyloglossia procedure. That's the lip and tongue tie release that you do with a laser. And you do that on infants that have been unable to nurse. And maybe that's a service that you'd like to offer um, in your practice. Maybe you enjoy uh, treating TMD, a uh, TMJ. Um, and maybe that's something that, you know, you really find exciting. Uh, maybe you're that dentist that enjoys a more expanded scope perio practice. Um, maybe you enjoy, enjoy doing certain types of periodontal surgery. And that could be something that could be with, with the right amount of CE. You know, that's something that you could incorporate into your practice. And there's just so many examples that we could go on and on about, but it's really kind of finding your passion. What is it that you're passionate about? You know, that would be a good question I would ask you to ask yourself. What is it clinically that you're passionate about? Maybe it's complex restorative dentistry, uh, where you have uh, patients that need have more complex dental needs, and you can do full mouth uh, restorative dentistry. And maybe that's something that, uh, you know, kind of tickles you. And the idea of doing more of that uh, is exciting. You know, one of the really cool things about high value dentistry is it, it you know, I've, I've always said that dentistry rocks because we have the ability to change people's lives every day. And I believe that with every ounce of my DNA. Um, and it could be, uh, you know, something in the general dentistry realm. It could be getting a patient out of pain, you know, could could be something that really, you know, the patient has a tremendous, it's, it's, cha it's changing for them. You know, it's, you know, to go from pain to not having pain, you know, is, is life-changing. But I tend to think more of the high value services as life-changing dentistry. When you provide a beautiful smile, when you replace a floppy lower denture, you know, with dental implants, um, when we take a smile that has spaces or crowding and through adult orthodontics, we give the patient a beautiful smile. When we take a patient that has a lot of patchwork dentistry done over years and years, and, and now we do full mouth restorative dentistry, that can truly be life-changing life-changing. The ankyloglossia procedure could be life-changing, especially for, for the mom, you know, who genuinely wants to nurse, but isn't able to because their, their infant can't lapse. That can be life-changing dentistry. TMD, TMJ, life-changing because patient living with pain is no fun. And through your care, skill, and judgment, you, you get them to a point where they're not experiencing pain. And that can certainly be considered life, uh, you know, life-changing. But I think the high value services are more often associated with life-changing dentistry, you know, than, than everyday general dentistry. Okay. Um, well, um, let me just recap here. Um, so the question is, what is the best practice model? And my initial answer was it depends. And it depends because it depends where your interests are. But I think a very useful practice model is uh, where the foundation of your practice, think of it bread and butter, the foundation is everyday general dentistry, but then you grow the high value component of your practice, think of that as the proverbial frosting on the cake. You grow that as much as you like. Uh, so you can do more of those services as well. And I think that is uh, a winning practice model. <clears throat> well, I hope this has been useful for you. We've got some really cool questions coming up, um, all built around how do I grow the high value services in my practice? Let's hit pause in this uh, coaching and action segment. And we'll get to the Thriving Dentist Q&A segment. Welcome back to the Thriving Dentist Q&A segment. Gary, I really enjoyed our conversation today. And I really love the topic. What is the best practice model? And I, I, I of course, uh, agree with your recommendation and, and your suggestion. You know, a practice that is perhaps anchored on general dentistry, plus all the high value services you enjoy. So I think that that sounds that sounds like a lot of successful dentists I know. So uh, so it I is think, a winning. It is truly a winning practice model uh, for sure. Right. Um, let me jump into the Q and A segment, and I have four questions for you, Gary. The first one is, what is the best way to do more Invisalign in my practice? Well, uh, Naren, I cheated and I looked ahead at our questions. 
And all four of our questions are built around doing more of a particular service. First one, of course, is Invisalign. I want to do more Invisalign. Uh, big fan of incorporating Invisalign in your practice. And, when, and for those of you that are interested in that, I'd love you to do a ton of it in your practice. Um, but I do want to say relative to all four of these questions, we should talk a little bit about marketing. Uh, so you attract people, new patients to your practice that are interested in those services. And the best way to do that uh, today in 2023, at the time we're producing this episode, is, is through digital marketing. And through mastering key words and key phrases, so that when someone in your community is looking for a particular service, you show up on page one of Google. So it's using keywords and key phrases where you show up as page one, on page one. Um, and that'll bring more of those kind of patients into your practice. And the best way to do that, I would encourage you to follow in my footsteps, do what we did um, over six years ago. We started working with your firm, your marketing firm there in Equa. Um, to help us master digital marketing. And that has been uh, a fantastic strategy to do more of the high value services that we would like to do, you know, in, in life smiles. Um, for our listeners uh, that would like to learn more about how Equa can help you do that, I would encourage you to schedule a marketing strategy meeting uh, with, uh, with Equa. Uh, you can go to www.equa.com forward slash MSM, MSM stands for marketing strategy meeting. Um, right. Let me answer the question about Invisalign in a little bit more depth than just marketing, just digital marketing. Um, to grow Invisalign in your practice, one of the coolest things you can do is engage your team, uh, in particular, your hygienist. But we can also train your assistants to do this. And that is uh, to have your hygienist or assistants Look for patients with crowding or spaces, crowding or spaces. That's it. Crowding or spaces. And if the patient has crowding or spaces, the hygienist or the assistant can say something like this to your patient. I'll role play as if that's you, Naren. Uh, Naren, if there was a way to correct uh, the spaces in your teeth without brackets or braces, would you have any interest? and wait for the patient's response. Very often, the patient response is, oh yeah, I had braces as a kid and I was supposed to wear a retainer and I stopped wearing it and my teeth are starting to drift backwards and got these spaces now. And I just don't want to look like I'm back in middle school again. And that's what we hear the majority of the time. Oh yeah. Uh, then we can say, Naren, uh, when doctor comes in to do her exam, I'm going to ask her to take a look and see if you're a candidate for Invisalign. Invisalign, you may have heard about it. Invisalign is state-of-the-art adult orthodontics that doesn't involve brackets or braces. Would that be okay if I had her take a look when she comes in? Absolutely. In fact, many times it's, please, yes, I want to know. And then we do a pass-off to the doctor, a verbal pass-off. Um, Dr. Linda, um, Naren is interested in learning if he could correct the spaces in his teeth with Invisalign, would you do me a favor and take a look? Takes a look and the majority of the time, the answer is yes. And the patient's interested and we talk to them about Invisalign. It's a great icebreaker to introduce Invisalign. Now I wanna uh, share a possibility, Naren. And it might seem like a, a stretch, but this actually happened in real life with one of my clients. And if it's been, if it happened before, guess what? It must be possible, right? Right. I had a client that historically for a number of years was just kind of piddling around with Invisalign. He was doing three starts a year, three cases a year. Can we agree? That's not so much. That's not, that's not much at all. In fact, he said, Gary, um, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I do so little of this. I have to pull out my Invisalign manual <laughs> and refresh my memory about this. And I was about to, uh, uh, you know, tell them you either got to do more of this to make, you know, some economy of scale in your practice with this or stop doing it all because it's a nuisance. Uh, and we introduced that. So I shared with them exactly what I shared with you about having the hygienist look for Invisalign, you know, look for crowding or spaces. Just like I said, if there was a way to correct the crowding without brackets or braces, would you have any interest? If the patient says, no, I don't care at all about what my teeth look like, then make a note in the digital chart and 
don't bring it up again. <laughs> We're not going to pound a square peg in the round in a round hole. Right. But most people are going to say yes. I would thank you. I'd love to learn about that. Uh, this office went from that's the only thing we did. That's it. We trained the hygienist to do what I just described and the assistants because it could happen on the assistant side too. And that office went from three Invisaligns a year to one start a week. Hmm. We went from three a year to 50. And that's all that we did. That's it. Now your mileage may vary, <laughs> but if it's been done before, it must be possible. There you go. And, and the beauty in it is the simplicity. Sometimes we make things too complicated. The hygienist isn't looking for anterior guidance. She isn't looking for posterior occlusion. She's looking for what? Spaces are crowding. Crowding, exactly. Make it That's simple. It. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's all they're looking for. Well, um, anyone interested in growing Invisalign? There is a solution. Remember, Equa can also help you with keywords and key phrases. So when someone's looking for Invisalign, you show up. And they, you know, that's another winning strategy for that as well. Absolutely. And there are like 40 different keywords and phrases you can rank for near the top of Google um, related to Invisalign uh, and related to any types of you know braces. Absolutely. Let me ask you the second question, Gary. How can I grow the cosmetic dentistry component in my practice? <clears throat> uh, great question. Uh, now, again, you know, I'm going to go back to what I said in the intro to this Q&A segment, you know, master digital marketing and, and attract people that are interested in gorgeous smiles, <laughs> you know, beautiful smiles. Um, but as far as your existing patient base, one of the best things you can do to do more cosmetic dentistry is, is take some professionally done, take some after photos of patients that you've done cosmetic dentistry with. To after photos. So that would encourage you, even though I, I imagine that many of our listeners are very competent photographers, I would invest in professional photography because those photos are going to be amazing. Uh, take some photos of patients, just the after photos that you've done, you know, say a, a 10 unit upper anterior porcelain veneer case, a 20 unit uh, porcelain veneer case, and put those photos up in your office. Now, obviously, you want to get the you have to get the patient's permission. Uh, to use their photos for uh, marketing and educational reasons. Um, but get these photos posted in, in your office. Um, and I would encourage you to have some variation of what I call the practice tour, where we take the new patient on a quick tour of your practice. It's literally three minutes, four minutes if they're a talker. And we're going to stop by one of those photos maybe near the end of that three or four minute tour. And we're going to say, uh, Naren, while our doctor um, has skills in, in everyday general dentistry, we also have advanced training in cosmetic dentistry where we can help our patients have the smile of their dreams. The photos you see up here in, in our office are actual patients of ours that we've helped have the smile of their dreams. Now we know it's on their rate. Now they know you do that. And very often when, when they look at that photo, uh, by the way, it'd be useful to have a wide variety of photos, different ages, both genders, men and women, and different ethnic uh, backgrounds of patients. So literally what you're communicating through your photos is a beautiful smile is appropriate for anyone, for anyone at all. That's a great way to grow the cosmetic component of your practice. You mind if I add a couple of tips, Gary? Please. So I totally agree with those after photos and a couple of uh, points I would add from a digital marketing standpoint. One is we used to recommend, you know, teeth pictures, but now we are found, finding those complete face pictures, the entire face, because that shows transformations. That shows how a person used to look, if you can also get the before and then after, and then put it on the relevant pages. So one of our mutual clients, Dr. Hoyt, he is crushing it for veneers, like for 40 different keywords, he's at the top. Now I Google it, I see him organically at the top of Google search results. I click on that link, I go to his page. There are those six cases, beautiful cases of before face picture and after face picture. And the other thing he has done that was that is brilliant is everyone looks different. There's a lady who's in her 50s, 
you know, forties man, you know, somebody who had a broken tooth in the middle of his teeth and somebody who had discoloration. So the patient can see himself or herself in that picture. And he told me once that one, two punch, the SEO plus those pictures, it's like a game changer. He's getting big cases right off the street, you know, because of those two things. I think uh, Niran, the, the, um, Niran, I think the, um, before and after photos belong on your website, right. Or belong in an electronic photo album. I don't like to frame the before photos up. In I, the agree. Because I agree. I agree. It's kind of demeaning for the patient, right? I get it's it. Scary. Yeah. 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 It's actually scary to most people. Right. Um, but I do agree in on the website and on the uh, digital photo album, those before and afters can be radically um, persuasive. Right. Thank you. Yeah. I think as part of the digital marketing strategy, that also would hopefully help you. Great, great suggestion. A third question, what are your best strategies for doing more dental implants in my practice? Uh, uh, so dental implants, you know, dental implants um, is, is one of those areas that there's, again, a lot of flavors of dental implants. Uh, some practices uh, stay on the more conservative side of implants and maybe just replacing a single missing tooth. Uh, but I happen to think that there's one area of dental implants with the proper training represents an absolute bonanza to grow your practice. And that's replacing a floppy lower denture. Uh, Naren, you probably know that in the world of dentures, uh, it's a bit counterintuitive. Um, the lower denture doesn't work very well for most people. The upper, den the upper denture tends to work well for people. You would think that that one would fall down, <laughs> but no, that one actually, because of suction, uh, the upper denture tends to actually work, you know, uh, as well as a denture could work. But the lower denture often gets floppy and, uh, you know, it's flopping around and, you know, you can keep relining it, but it gets to a point where you can't reline it anymore because they keep losing bone. And so the patient is so frustrated. They have this floppy lower denture. It doesn't look good. It's loose. It's sliding around. They can't eat what they want and they are not happy. And they're highly motivated to get that replaced. So I happen to think that if you were to uh, learn how to do the all on X technique, all on four, all on six, where you place four or six implants, uh, and then you do a, um, a, uh, a screw retained hybrid denture, where that lower denture is screw retained. So as far as the patient's concerned, it's fixed. But as you know, you could remove that for repair or cleaning if necessary. You could, uh, not the patient. Um, that represents a great way to grow grow your practice, um, and I think one of the the, the um, one of the ways that you could grow this in your practice is Naren. Have you ever heard the saying, "Birds of a feather flock together"? Yes. What yes. does that mean in your mind? Yeah, I mean, it means. I mean, I, I can answer it in two ways. One is from a just a basic perspective, and then from a psychological perspective. From a psychological perspective, I think. We all think we are unique. So um, we tend to do things that people like us do. Um, and, and of course, a classic example, you know, like we focus in dentistry and because we focus in dentistry, other dentists find us because we are helping someone they know or another dentist like them. Yeah, you know, if, if think about it for a minute. Let's say uh, you've helped a patient replace the floppy lower denture with a fixed in their mind you know, right. a, a all on X implant procedure, and they are absolutely thrilled. Right. That patient probably is of the age set that they have other people that are like them. They may know others that are struggling with a floppy lower denture. Right. So turning those patients into your best ambassadors, you know, when George says, doctor, I am so thrilled that I did this. I wish I would have done it sooner. You know, you can look for that opportunity to say, you know, George, you just made my day. Um, thank you for sharing that with me. You know, George, you probably know other people that are like you, you know, suffering from some of those same concerns. If you if you know any people like that, please know we'd love to help them as well. And they'll go out and, and talk. They'll become your best ambassadors because of what you've done for them. Exactly. And I think uh, to take it a step further, let's say, they're part of a community of people like them, perhaps 
they are, they play bingo together and there's like 50 people that they know and they meet once a month you could you know host one of those event evenings and bring some food and some wine and talk about what you did for so and so and he will be your biggest advocate in front of his buddies <laughs> well there are uh, you know in some communities uh, these senior uh, citizen communities yes um offer ongoing you know an opportunity to host something in their clubhouse to exactly. do an evening you know, to do just a, a quick little 30 minute, 45 minute uh, presentation on how dental implants can change your life um, mm -hmm. could be another good way to market those services in your practice, uh, for sure. Thank you, Gary. Let me ask the last and the fourth question I have. I really enjoy doing more full mouth restorative dentistry. What strategies have you seen that helps grow this element of a practice? Well, uh, full mouth restorative dentistry is a tricky one in terms of keywords and key phrases um, because the public doesn't know the language that we know. Right. Uh, they aren't, they aren't off, off, often typing in um, full mouth restorative dentist near me <laughs> um, because they just don't know that language. Right. Um, so I find that the best way to do that is to market now. Now, typically, Naren, it would be it, it could be a patient of any age, but it tends to be a patient that is more advanced in age. Um, tends to be a patient, say, you know, middle age and older, that would have enough going on in their mouth to to need full mouth restorative dentistry. Again, there could be exceptions to that. It could be a younger patient that, for whatever reason, has suffered some dental disease and they need a lot of work. But it's likely an older patient, so maybe we could market a little bit more demographically based on age, patients that are. 50 and older, 60 and older, um, and market that to because it's likely that they have concerns. But in the same way, we could use after photos in the office. Uh, think about a patient maybe in their 70s, could be male or female, uh, that you have taken and uh, absolutely provided a gorgeous full mouth restorative case with them. And to have that photo up on the wall and, you know, again, the language would be, um, we love doing everyday general dentistry, but we also enjoy helping patients with more complex uh, dental needs. Um, this patient here is someone that doctor was able to help restore their smile, give them a second chance at great oral health uh, through uh, full mouth restorative dentistry. And if the patient that you're talking to is of the same age set, that might spark some interest in having that done for themselves. So that could be marketed very well internally. Um, uh, through that strategy as well. Well, hey, this has been a fun episode. I hope you've enjoyed uh, this episode. What is the best practice model? I hope I've encouraged you to uh, find your passion in dentistry. Hey, a winning formula is doing more of what you like to do, whatever that is. Find out what it is. Answer the question. What do you like doing? And let's do more of that. Um, Naren, as we come come to the finish line today, I want to take a minute and say thanks to you for co-hosting this episode. Also, thank you to you and all your team members at Equa uh, that do all the amazing work, uh, not only at Life Smiles, but for um, uh, many of my clients as well. I appreciate that marketing support. Hard to uh, have a thriving practice without uh, a strong uh, marketing support. Also, want to thank all of our listeners. We appreciate each and every one, one of you here on the Thriving Dentist Show. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Thriving Dentist Show with your colleagues. On that note, I simply want to thank you for the privilege of your time and tell you we look forward to connecting with you on the next Thriving Dentist Show.